what essentially will be a very brief talk today. And what I want to talk about is specifically being joyful on the spiritual path. Because this is something that's very important. What is one of the primary reasons why we even practice spirituality? It's in order to experience joyfulness, in order to experience happiness. As it is, this world is very hard. This world is very difficult. There's a lot of suffering here that each one of us goes through on a day-to-day -day basis, and very practically. We go through depressions, we go through negativity, we go through days, weeks, sometimes months. In the case of some people, sometimes years, in which there seems to be a dark cloud just kind of hanging over us. And that is one very big thing that actually drives people to spirituality, is the fact that they have forgotten how to experience joy. In some cases, maybe they literally never even knew how to experience joy. And this is something that, despite having never experienced it, they know it's something that they should experience. It's something that they crave, something that they yearn for. So this very often is one of the factors that leads a person to spirituality to begin with, is that, again, they want to experience that joy and happiness that maybe they have only tasted slight bits of in the past. Well, what's interesting is that, of course, spirituality does indeed provide joy. It is something that is joyful by nature. It's meant to be joyful by nature. The reason why this is the case is because spirituality draws us back to our true selves. But I don't want to get ahead of myself with my talk. Let me just say that this is one of the primary motivational factors for why a person chooses to be spiritual. Is that they know that they're missing something of great importance in their life. Something of personal importance, something that they know they should be tasting, and maybe right now they're not. But more than this, let's go a little bit deeper. Okay, this is what brings people to spirituality, but then, interestingly, even in the process of spirituality, this is actually a very common occurrence, that you will have people who are in fact practicing spirituality at the very beginnings of their lives, just starting and still not necessarily feeling all the joy that they know they can. Certainly they'll experience some because that's what keeps them on the path. <clears throat> but still, it's not something that's necessarily consistent in the very beginning. It's something where, yes, you'll have a nice experience at a temple or doing meditation or something like this, <clears throat> but then the joy is inconsistent. It doesn't necessarily last. You'll have joy for a period of time, but then, again, the material world will seem to once again start to encroach upon your life. You'll start to think of problems again. And it's like, it's like you have one foot in the spiritual world, one foot in the material world. Experiencing joys of puja and kirtan and meditation sometimes. But then material things also begin to encroach. And it's like you go back and forth. And interestingly... This can be especially a very disturbing time for an individual who is spiritual. The reason why this is the case is because if it's black and white, it seems easier to deal with. If it's either that, okay, I'm experiencing joy, or, oh, I'm just accustomed to not experiencing joy, my life is miserable, at least it's something that's consistent. At least it's something where, okay, you get accustomed to not being happy. So it seems like something better, when in actuality it's not. Even being in this stage where, all right, now you're on the spiritual path, but you're not experiencing ecstatic bliss, you know, to paraphrase Prabhupada, you're not experiencing ecstatic bliss 24 hours a day, it's still better to be on the spiritual path, and this is the reason why. The nature of progress is incrementalism. The nature of spiritual progress also is that by increments, we get better and better as people. We learn about ourselves more and more over time. And the experience of joy that we begin to have deepens and deepens and deepens. But again, in the very beginning, it's not consistent. So there will be times where we go through what's called a dark night of the soul every so often. Again, feeling wonderful, spiritual, but then suddenly, again, the dark cloud seems to come back, this dark night of the soul as it's called. Now, this is what I'm going to be talking about, is how as spiritual practitioners we can remain joyful, we can remain positive, and we can retain hope. 
hope in ourselves, hope in the future, hope in the fact that we will achieve the goal of the spiritual path. So this is what I'll be talking about today, very specifically. Before I do this, however, I just want to say this. Sanatana Dharma, the yogic path, the path that all of us are on, is a path of joy, of positivity, and of hope. That is what it is. Like with any religion, religion can be expressed in different ways, and we've seen this. We've seen this. So we've seen that many religions can kind of go back and forth, be a little bit negative, a little bit positive, etc. When it comes to Sanatana Dharma, on the other hand, this truly is a path of positivity. It is a path of hope. It is a path where we are meant to experience happiness, and in fact, not just happiness, something beyond happiness. See, happiness is what we experience when situations in our environment are going our way. That's the general definition of happiness. You know, you say to someone who has a successful life, they have everything that they need, or are you happy? Why, well, yes, I am. But what we're talking about when we talk about joy is something much more than just this, just this sort of, uh, happiness as a result of good circumstance. What we are meant to experience in Sanatana Dharma is bliss. It is a state of consciousness that we are meant to experience that is not just the negation of suffering, but more than this. It is a constant state that is there in which you are feeling, quite literally, bliss that is something that is beyond emotion. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Before I go on, again, I want to explain how Sanatana Dharma is a path of joy. And by doing that, I'm going to read three verses from various scriptures. And trust me, I could have found hundreds of such verses, because there are many verses in which this is discussed, how we are meant to be joyful on the path. But I want to just mention these three verses very specifically. The first one, and you're, you can feel free to look these up on your own if you have time. The first one is from Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, second chapter, verse 22. And this is a very nice verse, and I will read this. These are all Prabhupada's translations. I didn't have time to translate these myself. Plus, these are beautiful translations. I love Prabhupada's translations. So this is the first verse. Certainly, therefore, since time immemorial, all transcendentalists have been rendering devotional service to Lord Vasudeva, the Personality of Godhead, with great delight, because such devotional service is enlivening to the Self. So again, a very, very nice, very positive verse about what is the result of having bhakti, having devotion to God. It's enlivening. It's something that's delightful, according to Srimad Bhagavatam. Now the next verse, and this next verse is from the 10th canto, chapter 40, verse 16. And this is the verse. To enjoy your pastimes, you manifest yourself in various forms in this material world. And these incarnations cleanse away all the unhappiness of those who joyfully chant your glories. So again, very beautiful verse from Srimad Bhagavatam explaining why it is that God comes upon this earth. And it's interesting, with our Srimad Bhagavatam class, we didn't cover this verse specifically, but we did talk about, I'm sorry, not the Srimad Bhagavatam class, it was Ramanavami, actually. And in fact, this will be our next video coming out, so you'll see this. I discuss why it is that the avatar comes. And I explain what is there in Bhagavad Gita, yada yada hidhara masya glani bhavati bharata, etc. I explain this, uh, why the incarnation comes, why the avatar comes. But then I went a little bit deeper. In addition to what the Bhagavad Gita says, that is that God comes upon the earth to uphold dharma, to vina shaya dushkritam, to annihilate those who are anti-dharmic, and to protect his devotees. In addition to those three things, there was something else that I mentioned on that in that talk that again will be released as a video. And that is, he comes for his devotees. He comes so that his devotees can see him and have joy in his presence. 
And if anything, that's the most important reason why he comes. That's the esoteric reason why we have the avatar, why Krishna comes, Rama comes, Narasimha, all of these avatars. They come very specifically to make their devotees happy. So it's interesting that this verse from Srimad Bhagavatam is saying the exact same thing. And then finally, from Bhagavad Gita, and this is one of my favorite verses, it's very known, very well known verse. This is Bhagavad Gita chapter 9, verse 2, where Krishna says, this knowledge, and he means what he's been teaching in the Bhagavad Gita, this knowledge is Raja Vidya, the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. It is the purest knowledge, and because it gives direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of Dharma. And then finally he has this last sentence. It is everlasting and it is joyfully performed. Joyfully performed. This has always been one of my favorite verses, interestingly, and specifically because of that last clause of that last sentence. This is a path that is meant to be experienced in joy. It's not a dour path. It's not a negative path. Again, it's so unfortunate. Like I was saying before about sometimes the, some people have this idea that what it means to be spiritual is that you never smile, that you never express emotion, that you're just literally dour, dour all the time. Just being very austere and just deriving no joy out of anything. Interestingly, Sanatana Dharma and this path, the yogic path, teaches us the opposite. When we are a spiritual person, we actually do smile. Not in a frivolous way, not in a silly way, not in a nervous way. Rather, we smile because we are happy. We have joy. And we express that joy. We express that joy through humor. We express that joy by wanting to give joy to other people, etc. So this is a very, very natural path. Now, I mentioned three things, and I want to talk about these three things specifically. That is joy, positivity, and hope. Now, first of all, what are the negatives of these? You know, because we understand those three things, at least what the words mean, but in a second I'm going to go deeper. First of all, joy. What is the opposite of joy? It's depression. Positivity. What is its natural opposite? Well, of course, negativity, being negative all the time. Uh, rather than thinking the best of people, we tend to think the worst of people, etc., etc. And then finally, hope. What is the opposite of hope? It's despair. Being in despair. Thinking that, oh, I have no future. I have nothing to look forward to. Everything ultimately is just going to lead to doom, etc., etc. Either just about myself or the world in general or both. And these three things very specifically, depression, negativity, and despair seem to be three things that, again, so many people are experiencing in our world today. Millions of people are experiencing this in our world and have experienced this for quite some time. And that, due to many, many factors that we don't need to go into, uh, some of them are self-imposed, many of them are as a result of the very culture itself. In fact, let me actually talk about this for a second. When you have a culture, a civilization, a society in which God is absent, we're going to have depression. We're going to have negativity. We're going to have a sense of hopelessness, a type of despair. This is simply the way it is. People have done studies for a very, very long time, you know, over, over uh, many, many different societies, across many different cultures, where they've seen that People who are spiritual do tend to be happier. Not perfectly so. Again, they have their downtimes also. But generally speaking, if you have a society where things are meaningless, you're not going to have joy. You're not going to have any sort of positivity. What is there to be positive about? There's no basis for positivity. And finally, hope is going to be gone. So, so many of us experience these things today. These are the enemies that we want to defeat. We want to defeat depression, negativity, and despair by cultivating their opposite, joy, positivity, and hope, respectively. So let's talk a little bit about these three things that, as dharmis, 
as individuals following Sanatana Dharma, we want to cultivate in ourselves. And again, let me emphasize that for a moment. These three things, again, and you'll hear me repeat these many times because they're crucial. This is what we're talking about today. Joy, positivity, and hope. We need to cultivate these things in ourselves. So that's why I'm going to talk about these specifically. This is what I mean by cultivate. If any of us have the idea that having commenced our spiritual path, that necessarily these things, these three things are just going to spring up in us automatically. Oh, but wait a minute, I've been meditating for a year. You know why? You know, of course, I'm going to immediately have joy and all these things. Uh, no, these are meant to be cultivated. Anything that is good, any good behavior, any good characteristic, quality, experience needs to be cultivated. What does that mean? We have to give them our attention if we want them to be present and to grow. So again, let me talk about these things just a little bit. First of all, joy. Joy. Pramoda in Sanskrit, but also, of course, ananda. Ananda, joy or bliss. Ananda is an attribute of consciousness itself. We know that, for example, in the Upanishads, the Upanishads talk about how three of the primary aspects of consciousness are sat, chit, and ananda, and ananda being the bliss factor. Now, what is meant by attributes of consciousness, attributes of the soul? What this means is that being joyful, being in bliss, is actually what we are meant to experience. This is the natural state for us. This is something that is inbuilt, one could say, within our very soul itself. Why is this the case? Well, of course, because we ourselves are sparks of consciousness. And sparks of whose consciousness? Of the ultimate consciousness. We are Atman, but we are byproducts of Paramatman, of God. So God, having all of these qualities within him to a perfect and an infinite depthful degree, then of course we have these things. So this is what's amazing. Speaking about joy, speaking about Ananda, this is something that is natural to our very souls. And in fact, if anything, when we are experiencing the opposite of that, when we're experiencing you know, any sort of suffering, we are experiencing something that is unnatural to who we are. Now the thing is, this is basic Vedantic and Dharmic philosophy. We know this. We've all heard this before. However, how many of us contemplate this fact? Not just the fact itself, in fact. Not just, oh, the philosoph how philosophically interesting it is. That, oh, yes, so being blissful is natural to who I am. How many of us contemplate this in a true and living way and think about the implications of this? Think of those times when, at any time in the totality of your life, you have experienced the most bliss, the most joy. And to think that that itself is just a tiny, the tiniest glimpse of what you truly are and what you're meant to experience. And how continuing with this path, what you are doing is slowly, and I have to emphasize, slowly, little by little, uncovering this true bliss that, that you are meant to experience. When you really contemplate this, it's incredibly inspiring. It's incredibly inspiring and more, and again, I'm going to talk about this part a little bit later. It is something that then encourages you to cultivate this bliss as much as possible. So, I want to quote something, speaking about joy, about bliss, Ananda, from my guru, B.R. Sridhar Swami, Bhakti Rakshaka Sridhar Swami. And this is something that is very beautiful. I remember when I first read this, actually, this is from a book um, called The Search for Sri Krishna, Reality the Beautiful. The Search for Sri Krishna, Reality the Beautiful. This was the first book by my guru that I ever read, and it must have been around 1984, more or less, something like that. And I remember when I read this, just feeling incredibly happy at reading this, because I had never read something so positive and so beautiful in relationship to Krishna consciousness. And this is from the introduction. If you have that book, uh, you can look it up. If you don't have the book, please get it. So the book is called Shri, The Search for Sri Krishna. And this is from the introduction. And 
Sridhar Swami, Sridhar Deva Goswami, he says this, quote, You were born in nectar. You were born to taste nectar. And you must not allow yourselves to be satisfied with anything but nectar. So, however misguided you may be for the time being, awake, arise, search for that nectar, that satisfaction. So, very beautiful what he says here. Absolutely beautiful. And again, when I first read this, maybe around 1984 or so, I was very, very inspired. What is that nectar? That nectar is bliss. What is that nectar? Amuritam. What is that? That is exactly the joy that we are meant to be experiencing in relationship to God and understanding our true selves. So let's go on a little bit more now. Again, there are three things we're going to talk about. The first was joy. The second is positivity. Niyata bhava. Niyata bhava is the Sanskrit for positivity. There's an actual word for being positive, for positivity in Sanskrit. Does that surprise anyone? <laughs> There's a word for, uh, oh, trust me, any concept that exists in English, there is absolutely a word for, and if anything, probably multiple words. But niyata bhava uh, means positivity, being positive. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit. So when we talk about positivity, of course, we're talking about what is one of really a dual state. You can either be positive or you can be negative. You can engage in positivity or negativity. And what really is the difference between the two? Well, this is something which when contemplating this talk today, I realized that we could actually talk very, very deeply about. And I actually thought to myself, okay, how should we approach this? I don't want to give an hour long talk just about positivity versus negativity. And instead, in order to understand this in a very nice, easy way, I decided that this made more sense, understanding these two states of mind, which is what they are, in accordance with guna, in accordance with the idea of guna, you know, sattva guna, raja guna, uh, tama guna. And looking at these two states of mind, negativity is tamasic. Negativity is of the nature of tama guna. When we think about Tama Guna, and I think most of us here have a good understanding of what are meant by these Gunas. I'm looking at everyone who's here, and I know everyone here has a very good understanding. What is meant by Tama Guna? Well, think of the qualities of Tamas. What are the qualities? They, those qualities are dullness, a dragging downward, ignorance, uh, lack of energy, etc., etc. I think, again, I think everyone here knows what's meant by Tamas. Now think of negativity. When one is negative all the time, you are displaying mentally exactly tamaguna. When you're feeling negative, you have no energy. Why would you have energy? If you're feeling negative, the idea is that, well, there's no reason to do anything. There's no reason to even get up in the morning. Anything I do, well, it's just gonna end up in failure anyway, see? This is how the mind works when we're negative. We think the worst of everything, of every situation, of the future, of others, etc. And again, this is of the nature of tamas. Now, positivity, of course, you can see where I'm going with this, is of the nature of sattva. It's just, just the very opposite. What is sattva guna? What are the qualities of sattva? Just the opposite of tamas. When we are sattvic, we feel energetic, we feel bright, we feel happy, we feel like doing spiritual things. We feel hope for the future. We feel as if people around me, yes, you know, they may not be perfect, but people overall are good. And I feel like smiling at individuals when I see them. The environment is good, etc., etc. This is sattva. And in the same way, positivity, being sattvic in nature, makes us feel accordingly. When we are feeling positive, now we can do things. And not just do things. See, I left out one thing, Rajaguna, doing for the sake of doing. We don't want to do for the sake of doing. We don't want to be simply pure energy. Rather, positivity is sattvic. We are now doing, but we're doing with wisdom. We are doing things for a good reason, for a good outcome, for others and for ourselves. So again, positivity versus negativity. These are two mental states. And if we want to be successful on the spiritual path, and more, if we want to be individuals 
who are everything that we know we can be, manifesting our full positive potential, then we want to cultivate positivity as much as possible. What does that look like? When you think about the world around you, when you think about yourself, when you think about your situation, when you think about others, when you think about the future, think the best, not the worst. Think the best, not the worst. Realistically, of course, that's important. We don't want to be new agey people who the world is, is literally on fire around us and we pretend that there's no fire. See, that's silliness. That's the new age mentality. We don't want that. But no, as much as possible with what is happening around us, give every, give every situation and person the benefit of the doubt. And always try to understand that as a servant of God, we are taken care of. As a servant of God, even though externally things may not seem to be going well, we are servants of God. And as a result, we are taken care of. That alone is the most powerful basis of spiritual positivity. All right. Finally, Ashvasa, hope. And yes, there's a word for hope, Ashvasa. Hope is crucial. Without hope, you can accomplish nothing. If you're in despair, if you feel that, oh, it doesn't matter what I do, this is going to end up in failure no matter what, it's guaranteed. Then, of course, for most individuals, not all of us, but for most individuals, when you feel that sense of despair, that regardless of whatever actions I do, it's guaranteed. Oh, I know it's going to end up uh, in failure anyway then you won't even begin, you won't even start. So this is why it's very important to cultivate the idea of hope, the mentality of hope. Because the truth of the matter is, nothing in this world is guaranteed. But you know what? Rather than seeing this, again, as a negative, see it as a positive. Yes, you may be in a situation right now. You may find yourself in a situation in which it seems hopeless and you cannot find a way out using what? Our limited intelligence, using our limited sense perception, etc. Ashvasa, hope. The idea is that if you, even if you feel that things are at their worst, even if you feel that, you know, there's no way out of this current situation, what am I to do? This is the thing. Thomas A. Kempis, you know, another great, interestingly, Christian theologian. He's the person who said this, and Prabhupada repeated this a million times because he loved this saying, man proposes, God disposes. How many here have read Prabhupada in, in his writings where he says this again and again in his lectures also? He says this again and again. Man proposes, God disposes. I didn't know this. I just learned this about a week ago, actually, that uh, it was actually Thomas A. Kempis who said this, who was a Christian theologian. And again, Prabhupada would quote him. Meaning what, though? Meaning always have hope because we can have our proposition. In other words, we can have what we think is reality. Oh, this is not going to work. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what I do, it's not going to work. But guess what? God disposes. In other words, ultimately it's up to God. We may find ourselves in what seems like a hopeless situation, but in God there is nothing but hope. When we have God with us, we have the very basis of hope itself. And we have to understand that Ultimately, it's God who is, what, like in the Bhagavad Gita, the charioteer. When we look at this uh, example of Krishna and Arjuna, we, of course, are like Arjuna. But who is the charioteer? Who is the person actually taking us to our destination? That is Krishna. See, there's a reason why, many reasons why Krishna was the charioteer. Krishna was not the person on the chariot being brought somewhere. Rather, he is the person in the actual driver's seat. So understanding this, this gives us reason for hope, even in the face of there seemingly not being hope. This is why we must never give up. Again, I want to very quickly just quote something from Bhagavad Gita to this effect. And this is Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, verse 22. And again, one of my favorite verses. I think this is the favorite verse of a lot of people, actually. But Krishna says, But those who worship me with devotion... 
meditating on my transcendental form. To them, I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. We are not alone. This is what Krishna is telling us. We are not alone. So when we find ourselves in life's journey, and that includes even when we are spiritual people, and again, our, spec our speculation, our, again, somewhat more new age idea that, well, I'm on the spiritual path now, so I should be experiencing nothing but joy. When we finally ex understand that that is not the case, Rather than going into despair, what we are to understand is that we are not alone, that God is there with us at all times, and that whatever it is that we're lacking, God will provide. God will provide. So again, very important reason to not give up hope. Now, all that being said, just a few very quick words of advice that I want to give to individuals who are spiritual when they're not experiencing joy at this exact moment. So this is just some practical advice I want to give people. First thing is, do not be self-indulgent, first of all, in giving in to negative feelings. See, like all things that are mayak, like all things that are illusory in nature, we've seen this with everything else. When there is something that is illusory in nature, doesn't it have a little bit of its own little sweetness that attracts us to it? If we want to give in to sadness, if we want to give in to negativity, to despair, uh, sometimes there's a little bit of an attraction to that because it's a type of self-indulgence where in a way we're saying, oh, look at me. This is the ego speaking to us. Oh, look at me. Everything is terrible, so I'm going to pout somewhat like a little child. For those individuals who have had children, we've seen this, where we'll see that, okay, all right, here's my little kid. And I know nothing really bad is happening in any way, but they want a little bit of attention. So what will they do? They'll play the victim card and they'll just kind of go into a corner, sit there and pout. Oh, and they'll start crying. Oh, I want this. I want this. Why isn't this going my way? And they'll do this, of course, to get attention from their parent. Again, anyone who's, who has been a parent has seen this. Anyone who has not been a parent yet, but who's going to be, trust me, you're going to see this. <laughs> How children will pout. They'll become self-indulgent in their emotions. Well, what we have seen is that in the 21st century, in 2018, unfortunately, a lot of so-called adults act like children and pout in the same way that a child, that a three-year-old will pout for attention. In the same way that it's self-indulgent, that it's mayak, that it's egotistical for a little child who you can see, well, this child has everything that they need. They're being taken care of, they're loved, etc. But at the same time, they want to sit in a corner and just indulge in their emotions. Oh, everything is terrible. Everything is horrible. Look at me. Some adults will do the same thing. When we find ourselves doing this, what we are to do is to first of all recognize it and second of all, transcend it as much as possible. So recognize this in ourselves. Now, this leads perfectly to the next thing that I want to tell people, and that is, do not confuse joy with mere emotion. See, this is another problem that people have, is that emotionally, they may not be feeling uh, happiness right then and there. And then they'll say to themselves, oh, I guess joy is something that is foreign to me. Not understanding that joy, the likes of which we're talking about, this anandam, it's not emotion. It's something that transcends emotion. We can feel happiness. We can feel sadness. We can feel anger. We can feel despair. We can feel so many things emotionally. But even on the positive spectrum of emotion, this is not what we're talking about when we talk about anandam. Rather, what we're talking about is quite literally a state of consciousness. What we're talking about is, again, an attribute of the soul. So because emotionally you're not necessarily feeling joyful and happy and jumping all up and down in great glee, don't mistake that emotion for the sort of joy that we're talking about, anandam. Rather, the sort of anandam that we're talking about is something that is so deep within that 
it transcends all emotion. It's something that is almost inexpressible. It is something that is a manifestation of soul itself, and it is something that comes about due to the very presence of God. So it's something that is a transcendental state. Few other things. When we are experiencing, again, negativity, despair, any of these negative things that I was talking about, and when we want to experience joy and positivity and hope, one of the most important things that we need to do is to take shelter of sadhana, something that's very important. I've seen again and again, both with my disciples, but other people as well, that when you're on the spiritual path, very often there is a direct correlation between, again, feeling bad, feeling negative, and not doing one sadhana. There is a direct correlation between the two. So, how to guarantee that one will remain upon the path of the cultivation of joy? Continue to do your sadhana. Continue to do those things that are going to help you to access that natural anandam that we're talking about. All right? Let go. Let go of ego. Let go of ahankara. Let go of maya, of illusion. Let go of the fruits of your action. If we can learn to let go of these three things very specifically, what then happens is that we unburden ourselves. These three things are quite literally burdens that keep us separated from experiencing our true anandam, that true bliss that is within. But at the same time, even the most spiritual of people sometimes hold on to these three things. They just hold on to them for dear life because it's what they know. And it's only in letting go of these things, unfortunately, that we do indeed have the ability to begin to experience actual joy. So let go of, and I'll repeat these three things, of ego, of illusion, and the fruits of action. Is this not what Krishna speaks about in the Bhagavad Gita? He tells Arjuna, do your duty, but do not be attached to the fruits of your action. In other words, like we were saying before, do what you need to do, but at the same time, understand everything is in God's hands, ultimately. Several other things. Surrender. Surrender. Really the very opposite of what we were talking about. Ego, illusion, being attached to the fruits of action, etc. The more we cultivate surrender at the feet of God, at the feet of Bhagavan, the more we are accessing the more we have proximity to precisely what we're looking for, the source of all joy, of all positivity, of all hope, etc. The more we come to know God, and as I always say, not just theoretically, but deeply, personally, within our very being, the more we are close to our source. And what is God ultimately? God is the source of all good, of everything that is positive, of, of an infinite number of auspicious attributes. That being the case, the more we surrender to this being, who is the source of an infinite number of auspicious attributes, how can we not but also engage in those attributes? How can we not also but be positive, be happy, etc.? The next thing... Allow God to direct you. This comes after surrender, interestingly. This comes as we're cultivating surrender. And this is something that's very difficult. And this is something which I can't go very deeply into right now, just due to lack of time. But this is something I would love to give an entire talk about, just this alone. Allowing God to direct us in everything that we do. We know that that's the goal, right? We understand, well, that's what it means to surrender to God, prapatti. We understand that's surrender and action. But what does that actually feel like? And again, this is something that really, to do it justice, I need to give a separate talk just on this alone. But ultimately, what it means to surrender is to allow God to direct us from within, to encounter our ego and remove that ego out of the way and allow God to bring us where he wants to bring us. And let me just leave it at that because again, this is something we would have to go very deeply into to give it full justice. Finally, cultivate true joy in every moment. Cultivate true joy. First, understanding, again, what is true joy, this anandam versus just emotion, which is fleeting. With emotion, 
oh, sometimes you're happy, sometimes not. It comes and goes, it waxes and wanes. But this true joy is always there because it is a part of who we are spiritually. So we are meant to cultivate this in every moment of our life. What do I mean by this? Anytime we do experience that joy, let's say we're deep in meditation or we're doing something spiritual and we are just feeling exhilarated and inspired and feeling that bliss that is there just arising from within, hang on to that as much as possible. Grab on to that moment, feel it, fully engage in it, and then when it starts to go away, because it will, because we're still within this material world and illusion, remember it. Remember it. Welcome it back into your life. And more than this, also in addition to actual spiritual joy, which again is something that you know we truly have to cultivate, even joys within the world that are sattvic, nice joys, good joys, pleasant joys, cultivate them, seek them out. And what do I mean? Let me give some examples. You're with good friends, good friends, people who, are, who themselves are spiritual, wonderful people. You find yourself with family members who truly love you. Just good company. Enjoy their company, if it is sattvic company. Let's say you find yourself watching even a movie, but something that's very inspiring. For me, people know it's Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that's probably my favorite movie of all time. You find yourself, let's say, watching a movie like this, and you're experiencing joy in the moment of watching this movie. Allow yourself to cultivate that joy, fully experience that joy, be aware of that joy that you're experiencing, and in this way, on and on. Uh, experiencing both spiritual joys, but also joys of this material world that are sattvic in nature. We can only understand and cultivate something if we have an inkling of what it is. And if you're not experiencing joy, how can you cultivate joy? You see? So this is why whenever you do experience joy, grab onto it. Understand how it feels, and in that way, you can bring it back again and again, and when it does come back of its own accord, you can welcome it. Quite literally, oh, welcome back into my life, O oh, Anandam. In this way, we welcome joy into our life. Good? All right. Well, that's my talk for today <laughs> about how we should be experiencing joy on the spiritual path. And whether we do or not, it's, a, it's up to us more than anything. More than anything. It's up to our decisions. It's up to our understanding of everything that I was talking about today and working in order to cultivate this joy as much as possible. So, have hope. Have hope. Be positive and experience joy as much as you can. It is in your hands. Jaya Shri Manarayana. Jaya Shri Manarayana.